Welcome to the next video in our Maintaining a Balance series. This video is going to be looking at three different dot points, uh, two theory dot points and one secondary source investigation. So the two theory dot points uh, outline the need for oxygen in living cells and explain why removal of carbon dioxide from cells is essential, followed by describe the main changes in the chemical composition of the blood as it moves around the body and identify tissues in which these changes occur. And the secondary source investigation, analyze information from secondary sources to identify current technologies that allow measurement of oxygen saturation and carbon dioxide concentrations in blood and describe and explain the conditions under which each of these technologies are used. So we're going to start by having a look at the two theory dot points. So oxygen and carbon dioxide as we know, plants and animals need energy for life. Now, the way that plants and animals obtain this energy is through the process of cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration takes place in every cell of our body in the mitochondria, and it is a process which requires oxygen and glucose and produces the metabolic wastes of carbon dioxide and water as a result. So both plants and animals undergo this process of respiration. So if we were to have a look at the equation for respiration, it does look like it is the reverse of photosynthesis, but we do need to remember that photosynthesis, as we know, only takes place in plants. However, cellular respiration takes both takes place sorry, in both plants and animals at all times of the day. So we need sunlight for photosynthesis to take place. So that obviously can only happen during daylight hours. However, respiration takes place over a 24 hour period. So if we have our cell, okay, so a simple cell here, and we start off with our reactants. So our two reactants for cellular respiration are oxygen, which obviously comes from the lungs, and glucose, which comes from the intestines that is absorbed from the food that we eat. So these two substances are then brought by the circulatory system to the cell. In the mitochondria, being the organelle of the cell which undergoes respiration, these two substances are broken down and the atoms are rearranged in order to form new uh, products. So the main thing that we get out of respiration is energy. So this energy is used for a wide range of bodily functions, in particular for movement and growth. So cells that undergo a greater amount of, or cells that require a greater amount of energy have a greater number of mitochondria so that cellular respiration can take place at a faster rate. So muscle cells will have a lot more mitochondria than skin cells, for example, because they obviously need to create lots more energy. The other two products that are formed are waste products, in particular carbon dioxide, which gets sent to the lungs so that we can breathe it out, and water, which also can get sent to the lungs uh, in order to be breathed out as water vapour. So we recall if we don't get rid of the carbon dioxide, it dissolves in the plasma in our blood turns our blood acidic and therefore leads to uh, the denaturation of our enzymes. So mammals cannot tolerate a change in the acidity in the blood, as I just said. When the carbon dioxide enters the blood, it combines with water to make carbonic acid and decreases the pH, which obviously leads to an increase in the acidity. So we recall that enzymes can only tolerate a narrow pH range for opt optimal functioning. And that depends on where in the body the enzyme works. So if the enzyme works in the stomach, it will be able to already withstand a fairly low pH. But if that pH decreases further, then it will begin to denature. Uh, enzymes in the intestines require a slightly higher pH. And therefore, any decrease in the pH is going to have a fairly large effect on the enzymes. So as we can see here, we have our water molecule combining with our carbon dioxide molecule to form uh, that carbonic acid, which uh, causes the decrease in the pH of the blood. And then what happens is our enzyme with its active site here changes, so it denatures, so the active site no longer is the same shape, so it won't be able to fit the substrate that it usually fits with. So looking at the chemical composition of the blood as it passes around the body. So our blood travels around the body in our circulatory system. And as it travels through different organs, the levels of different chemicals 
will increase or decrease depending on the organ and the function that it carries out. So we're going to start at the top and go around in a clockwise fashion and have a look at some of the changes that occur. So in the head and the arms, we have a decrease in oxygen as uh, the blood passes through the muscles in those particular areas, as well as a decrease in glucose and amino acids, as obviously they're taken into the cells in order to carry out cellular respiration. And then we have an increase in carbon dioxide. In the digestive tract, we have the absorption of nutrients as a result of the nutrients being created during digestion. So as we leave the digestive tract, the amount of these uh, the nutrients will decrease. So in particular, glucose, amino acid, uh, fatty acids, glycerols and vitamins will decrease as the blood leaves the digestive system as opposed to the blood entering the digestive system. Moving around to the kidneys, the kidney's job is to filter the blood to get rid of, get rid of uh, nitrogenous wastes, in particular urea. So the kidney's job is to filter the urea out of our blood. So the blood entering the kidneys has a high concentration of urea, but as the blood leaves the kidneys, that concentration of urea has decreased as the kidneys do their job to get rid of that uh, waste product. The kidneys will also help to reabsorb glucose and amino acids. So as the blood leaves the kidneys, the concentration of these will be higher uh, than the blood entering the kidneys. The trunk and the legs, so the bottom half of our body is exactly the same as the top half of our body. Lots of muscles and things that need to constantly be moving uh, in order to help us obviously move. So there will be a decrease in oxygen, glucose and amino acids. Again, oxygen and glucose being used for cellular respiration and an increase in carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Moving around to the liver, the liver's job is to break down amino acids, alcohol and vitamins. So as the blood comes into the liver, the concentration of those three substances is high. The liver then draws them out of the blood. So the blood leaving the, con uh, the liver sorry, has a low concentration of these substances. Depending on information from our feedback systems, the liver can also convert glucose to glycogen to store it for later use. So the amount of glucose going into the liver is greater than the amount of glucose in the blood leaving the liver. And in the liver, we will have an increase of urea in the blood leaving the liver because of the breakdown of all the other things that take place in the uh, liver causes a release of that nit those nitrogenous wastes, in particular urea. Then we come to the lungs. So obviously the blood entering the lungs is high in carbon dioxide because the blood has travelled all the way back to the lungs from all the cells in our body. So the blood has picked up all the carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of respiration, taken it back to the lungs. As the blood enters the lungs, we have a decrease in the carbon dioxide because that's being drawn into the lungs in order for us to breathe it out. But there will also be an increase in the oxygen in the blood leaving the lungs as the oxygen uh, gas exchange takes place in order for the oxygen to move out of the lungs into the bloodstream. So we recall that our endocrine glands uh, release hormones. So in particular, the adrenal glands release aldosterone, which we'll be having a look at a little bit later in the topic when we look at the kidneys. And the pituitary gland releases antidiuretic hormone. Again, we'll be looking at when we look at the kidneys. So the reason why they're there in their own little box is as the blood leaves the endocrine glands, we obviously have a higher concentration of these hormones than the blood entering. So now we're going to have a look at the uh, secondary source investigation dot point where we need to analyze some information from secondary sources. So this video can be one of your secondary sources, including the YouTube videos that are embedded within. And you'll need to do some extra research in order to be able to identify some current technologies that help us to measure oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations in blood, in particular of patients and explain where these technologies are being used. So one of the most common forms of uh, technology used in order to measure the amount of oxygen in the blood are the pulse oximeters. So these measure the amount of oxygen in arterial blood. 
So that is the blood being pumped from the heart to the body cells. So you recall from uh, a few seconds ago that the blood leaving the heart is higher, sorry, leaving the lungs is higher in oxygen and they are our arteries. So the blood comes from the lungs into the heart and then gets pumped out of the aorta back to the rest of the body through the arteries. So that's why uh, we use the arteries because they have the highest amount of oxygen. So what actually happens is that this little device here with um, two light emitting diodes, which are just little lights that shine a red um, a red light through a fingertip or a toe or an ear, depending on the patient, depending on what situation they're in. And what happens is the amount of light energy transmitted is detected by a photo detector. So the light energy will vary uh, depending on the level of oxygen in the blood. So if there's a greater amount of oxygen, less light will get through uh, and vice versa. So this process is non-invasive and provides rapid continuous monitoring. So uh, these, this technology sorry, is so simple that they're now actually producing uh, technology that you can plug into your smartphone and you can carry a pulse oximeter with you everywhere. So this is obviously going to be helpful for patients that require constant monitoring of their oxygen levels. So in particular, these pulse oximeters are used for patients who are under anesthetic, so they're asleep, during recovery after surgery, and intensive care units where they're undergoing mechanical ventilation. So they're patients who are constantly receiving oxygen. And what uh, happens is there's a display which constantly shows the saturation of oxygen. And if it drops too low, then the medical staff are brought aware very quickly. So this little video introduces a new piece of technology using uh, your mobile phone. So let's have a look. How can you make your smartphone smarter? How about turning your smartphone into a pulse ox? A pulse ox is a great non-invasive way to measure the percentage of blood that is saturated with oxygen. Typically, a saturation of greater than 92% is acceptable, although most people with normal lungs will have a saturation closer to 100%. So if your patient has a saturation lower than the acceptable value, you may need to administer oxygen therapy and or positive pressure. Also, another feature of the pulse ox is that if the patient's pulse is strong enough, it can measure the heart rate. And oh, did I mention it's available on your smartphone? So make your smartphone smarter with this pulse ox anytime, anywhere, any device. Okay, so as you can see, the technology is quite cheap, it's easy to come about, and it's extremely easy to use. So what we're going to do is have a look at a different piece of technology that can be used in order to gather uh, information in regards to the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood, which is known as the arterial blood gas analysis. So in this particular type of technology, blood samples are taken from a patient's artery, usually in their wrist, and the sample is tested in a blood gas analyzer. So uh, we'll be watching a video in a little second that goes through the steps of how a medical uh, person will take the blood. And then once the blood is taken, it's entered into a machine, the blood is spun, so it's centrifuged, and they're able to determine the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as the pH of the blood. This is quite an invasive procedure as uh, removing blood from an artery can be quite painful uh, and you'll see in the video that the, uh, the medical student taking the blood sample explains to the patient that is going to be quite a bit of pain. Also as we know blood is pumping through the arteries quite uh, strong through the force of the motion of the heart so therefore pressure needs to be applied to the wound or the um, puncture point in order to stop the patient from bleeding continually. So the arterial blood gas analysis provides information for critical ill patients who are on ventilators or undergoing respiratory therapy. So it just provides uh, doctors and nurses with a bit more information as opposed to simply 
the um, pulse oximeter, which just gives a percentage of the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. So watch this little video that goes through the steps. If you're not a fan of needles, you might want to stop here, um, but there isn't really much blood. <laughs> So as we can see, there's obviously a lot more equipment that's involved as opposed to simply the finger Hi, good afternoon. Probe. My name's Joe. I'm the final year medical student. Nice can I take you. your name, please? Yeah, it's uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Nice to meet you. Can I just check your date of birth, please? Yeah, it's the 14th of March, 1989. Okay. What I'd like to do today, Andrew, is take a blood sample. It's called an arterial blood gas, okay. and it comes from a blood vessel within the wrist. Okay. It's slightly different to blood samples that you might have had to take before. It can be a little bit sore, but it should be over in a couple of seconds. Is that alright with you? That's fine, yeah. Okay. One of the benefits of taking this um, particular type of sample is that it lets us look in more detail at how the oxygen is circulating around your body. Okay. Before we start, I need to ask a couple of questions. Okay. Is that alright? Yeah. Are you on any medications that can thin your blood at all? I'm thinking specifically of things like warfarin or aspirin. No, I don't think so. Okay. Are you aware of any problems in the past with clotting of your blood? No. And any problems with your liver at all? No. Okay, Andrew, I'd just like to check the blood flow in your hand. If you could just make a fist room, please. Okay, you have just relax your hand for me. I'd just like to start by having a feel of your pulse if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Sharp scratch. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. I'm going to take the sample that I've taken to the ABG analyzer. I'll be back shortly to give you the results. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So as we could see in the video, there's a definite difference between the two types of technology. The pulse oximeter is very easy to use, it's non-invasive, can be done at any time whether the patient is conscious or not. However, the arterial blood gas analysis requires obviously a puncture using a syringe that can be quite painful, so um, people may not appreciate that. So we'll be looking at those more in class through the secondary source investigation. And that's it for today.